Hey guys, it's me Whitney. Today I am going to show you all the books that I read in the second half of July. There are six of them and you know how I like to blab so I'm just gonna get started. The first thing that I read was Machine in the Garden. I don't know why I'm showing you this. It is just a library bind up copy, but this is the version that I read. It's called Machine in the Garden by Leo Marx. This is kind of a staple of American studies, and it's a staple especially if you're talking about um, the American landscape or the American sublime, uh, the natural sublime specifically, and I uh, hadn't read it yet. I had read so many books that had referenced it that I kind of kept putting this one off. Um, specifically David Nye, who was a student of Leo Marx, he wrote a book called The American Technological Sublime, um, which I found very useful to my dissertation. So he, you know, talks about this so much that I was like, oh, I've basically already read that. Not so. This book is like incredible. It really deserves the notoriety that it has in my field. And I know like book two, maybe you haven't heard of Leo Marx, and that's fine. Um, but he is writing about how there's this tendency in American fiction, especially these big canonized books um, and these big writers that we talk about so much, there is a tendency for them to talk about an American pastoral, um, this like being at one with nature, going out into the woods and kind of clearing your mind and being self-sufficient and self-reliant. I mean, this should be sounding like very familiar. This is Walden, right? Um, and there's this idea of an American pastoral, that the American landscape specifically can offer this kind of peace through being in nature. Um, but he's talking about the machine in the garden, which is these moments in American literature where suddenly some kind of like technological intervention happens. The one that I thought was the most remarkable was when he was talking about in Huckleberry Finn how Jim and Huck are traveling down the river together and they're talking about how great it is just to be out in nature and you know they're lying on the raft and looking up at the stars and then Huck saying like what do you think those stars are made of and Jim says he thinks the moon laid them. It's this famous moment in Huckleberry Finn and, and Huck kind of thinks about that and is like yeah I could see that and they see a falling star and Jim says uh, well that's one that it's, has escaped the nest. Like it's just this really calm peaceful kind of community building moment um, and suddenly as they're going going down the river, suddenly this big ship, this steamship, kind of like breaks apart their raft, right? And that's the machine in the garden, the intervention of technology. Well, America at the time wants to see itself, and not just at the time, always wants to see itself on the forefront of technological advancement, right? Um, at the same time as they want this American pastoral. So in Machine in the Garden, Leo Marx is talking about the tension between those two, where authors are kind of like putting their loyalties. Do we achieve greatness or peace through the landscape? Do we achieve it through technological advancement or is it some kind of juxtaposition between the two and he kind of recognizes that as this distinctly American moment in literature so it's a great book um, definitely like an academic type book but not one that um, people couldn't access like anybody um, whether or not you've studied sublime or pastoral or whatever he does a really good job of introducing the concept then in July, I read two P.D. James novels. I had never read P.D. James before, and I really like mysteries. So Kate Howe invited me to buddy read this book called The Murder Room, and there were a few people participating. There was Sarai at Sarai Talks Books, and there was Kate Tonks, and Kate Howe and Amanda Center. So it was this group of women talking about P.D. James. It was really fun, as usual. I'm really liking these buddy reads. Everybody had their theories of who done it, and um, I liked P.D. James's writing style. It was quite meticulous, and sometimes that could get a little dreary, but um, all of the details, it just felt like you were a detective going along. Uh, with the characters and sort of investigating the story to figure out who committed the murder and in that way it reminded me of Agatha Christie except for James always gives you all of the parts so conceivably you really could solve the mystery. I didn't, I never do, but a couple people in our little buddy read um, kind of figured it out. So that was a really fun experience so I went back and I read the first in the series. Um, the Murder Room is part of a series called the Adam Dalgleish series which is the detective although he's like a very minor figure in the Murder Room actually because that was like, I don't know, 14 books in or something. So I went back to the first, which was called Cover Her Face, 
and that one felt even more Agatha Christie like. It was a locked room mystery out in the countryside um, with rich British people and someone turns up dead and you have to figure out who done it. So I, I loved it. I have the second one out from the library. I'm gonna read this series. I think it's a really fun and really relaxing somehow so I like that. The next book I read was The Girls by Emma Klein and if you want to see a really great review of this book you should check out Conrad's channel the Deckel Edge, um, his wrap-up of, of the last month, he talks about what he thought of this book and he kind of rips it apart in a really funny way. So I would definitely go check out the Deckel Edge if you haven't watched that video already. Um, I didn't hate it as much as Conrad did. It's the story of a girl who gets involved in a Manson family-like cult. And when I say Manson family-like cult, I mean a Manson family cult. Like, it was exactly the Manson family story. And um, Liz from Now Voyaging had recommended this podcast called You Must Remember This, which I have now just, like, devoured. I'm almost done with that I'm almost up to date with that podcast. Um, but she uh, recommended the series on the Manson family, so I listened to that and then I read The Girls and it really matches up almost um, completely. Uh, there are a few little differences, but basically it's a novelization of the Manson family from the perspective of a member of the group who's also kind of on the outskirts, like a late member to the group. That concept is so intriguing and so good, and I can see why the book would sell for what it sold and why it's doing so well. People are kind of um, upset that this 27-year-old girl without much experience with writing, and maybe without the chops that she needed to actually pull this off, people are kind of upset that she's just this like sudden literary sensation, and I get that. But I also get why this concept would be so appealing to so many people. I think there's a lot of interest in cults and murder and blind faith and community think where people can kind of just like get swept up in a movement uh, and I think like our political race kind of shows why we might be interested in that concept like right now. Um, I'm not calling like the cult of Donald Trump a cult but it kind of has those same sort of tendencies to it, right? So I was really looking forward to the book. There is an immaturity there that really hurts it. Um, there's just like, the, there's structural problems, um, there's exploitation problems, there's definite problems with a kind of love story that happens in the plot, um, and Conrad talks about that on his channel. But what I did like about the book was, maybe because the author's so young, she's 27 again, um, she maybe can tap into what it felt like to be a teenage girl even better than somebody even just a few years older. Um, so I felt like there were moments where she talked about falling in love or thinking that you're falling in love as a teenager that were just so spot on and I had never thought of in that way. Um, she talks about how teenage girls kind of like pick a boy and then in their mind turn him into what they want him to be or what they've been told that they should want him to be. And I remember doing that, just sort of like picking a boy in a crowd that I barely even knew and just saying like, oh yeah, he's, you know, this kind of sensitive, he's this kind of assertive and, and whatever. Um, that moment really, really stuck with me. So there are those moments in here that those coming of age type moments that I thought were great. Um, but Conrad talks about how the main character does not change in any way and that was my main problem with the book because I don't know that that was intentional. It's an interesting choice but the story is intercut with the main character as an adult and her tendency to see the world through a teenage girl's eyes um, Maybe it was a comment on how this cult experience sort of froze her in time, but I don't know that I trust the author that much. I think it was just kind of a mistake that she didn't learn from any of her experiences. The next book that I read this month was Beloved by Toni Morrison. I finally read this. I never read this in high school. Um, a lot of people were assigned this book, but I kind of went the regular English route and they gave us very short books. Um, I just liked the teacher, but we basically read The Crucible and uh, Old Men and Sea and that was it. Like They were like, this is all these regular students can handle. They read this one in AP and Honors. Um, so I hadn't read it yet. It was a huge hole in my American Lit and I told you I was trying to fill some of those gaps this summer. Uh, it was incredible. What else can you say 
about Beloved that people haven't already said. I think that this book has been like very fully examined and you can find amazing reviews of this book um, and amazing essays. Uh, my favorite examination of this book again is through the lens of the sublime because that's what I study. But it's in this book called The Feminine Sublime by Barbara Claire Freeman and she talks about how um, Toni Morrison explains a sublime that's full of excess, that her characters can never fully rationalize their experiences, both of trauma and then um, the kind of supernatural experiences that exist in the book. So I'm not going to talk very much about this because I don't feel like at this point I can do it justice, but I'm still thinking about it. I still think it's incredible and definitely deserves its place in the American canon, one of the best books of American literature that I've ever read. The last book that I want to talk about is Hue and Cry, and it's another just like library bind up edition. It's not like beautiful or anything, but I pulled it out so that you could see this brown book that I have, I guess. Anyway, this is by James McPherson. It's a collection of short stories, and while not all of the short stories I think are as successful as others, there are a couple in here that are um, really, really good, and you can find them in anthologies. So if you didn't want to read all of Hue and Cry, although I think that you should, um, the two stories that I fell in love with were Gold Coast, which is the one that's most often anthologized, um, about this kind of like intellectual student type who decides to become a janitor for a little while in a racially diverse building. And he kind of um, makes friends like on accident with this like old racist guy that lives in the building that used to be janitor um, and like kind of like his experiences with that man and with the building. It works as an examination of race and class and how those two things work together. It's really good. And then the other story, the one that I liked even more than Gold Coast, is the title story, Hue and Cry, um, about a black woman who dates a white man and kind of has this long love affair with a white man, but it's not working out. And so she kind of goes through dating people of different races and the story is about how her race is such a vital component of her dating life and her love life in a way that's really uncomfortable um, and a way that's like forefronted against her will. It's really really good and it's really painful. Um, it reminded me kind of of what Eldridge Cleaver talks about in Soul on Ice when he divides um, different racial types into different categories and there's like all sorts of problems with that but I think that James McPherson gets at that problem in a way that is more subtle and more interesting than Eldridge Cleaver ever does. So were I to ever teach Eldridge Cleaver, I don't think I would in high school, but if I were to do that in college, I might pair it with this story, Hue and Cry, because it works so well together. So those are the six things that I read in the last two weeks of July. Uh, I hope you liked this video. If you have read any of these, let me know what you thought. I'm especially interested in what people are thinking of the girls, because it seems to be a very controversial pick right now. Um, and I know some people are really loving it and some people are really hating it and I fell right in between. <laughs> so let me know what you thought of that and I will see you in my next video. See ya!